Part 2, The Bombardment General Lee's original plan for Day 3 at Gettysburg was for a simultaneous dawn attack against the Union left and right. That plan fell apart, and I'm skipping over the story of how the original plan failed. The new plan called for an attack on the Union center, and that's what we now call Pickett's Charge. And Pickett's Charge was the main event on Day 3. General Lee planned to soften up the Union position with a bombardment, and this map shows artillery positions for both sides around noon. The bombardment was the biggest of the war to that point, and legend has it that you could hear it in Washington, D.C., 85 miles away. Confederate goals were described by Edwin Coddington in his book, The Gettysburg Campaign, as blast Union artillery into oblivion with a cannonade unparalleled in the annals of warfare, and to demoralize the Union infantry beyond the point of serious resistance, unquote. And further, according to Stephen Sears in his book Gettysburg, in Lee's scheme, artillery was supposed to advance along with the infantry to furnish close-in fire support during the charge, unquote. The Union goals during the bombardment were to survive it and then afterwards be ready to defend against the infantry attack. General Hunt was commander of the Union artillery, and he preached that the first priority was fire against infantry. The second priority was counter-battery fire against the Confederate artillery. Battery commanders were instructed to preserve their long-range ammunition, shell and case shot, so that they'd be able to attack the infantry at the start of their advance, and then use canister to finish off the infantry at close range. See this screen capture from a U.S. Army webpage. There were four types of artillery ammunition. There was solid shot, which was a metal ball with no explosive charge, and then the three types you see here in the cutaway diagram, shell, case, and canister. Solid shot, shell, and case were usually long-range ammunition. Canister was usually short-range ammunition. The amount of ammunition available became very important. Sears writes that Confederate General Pendleton should have kept track of the ammunition inventory. After three weeks on campaign, it seems obvious that Artillery Chief Pendleton would have kept a close count on what remained in the trains. If he did so, he did not inform anyone. He especially did not inform General Lee. There was no effort on anyone's part that morning to balance accounts between how much ammunition would be needed and how much was available, unquote. And Sears continued about a paragraph later, had Lee been fully informed by General Pendleton, the charge would not have been made, unquote. Also, there was a problem with the quality of Confederate ammunition. Sears writes that Confederate shells suffered from either exploding prematurely or not at all and that this was due to defective fuses. If you're interested in the issue with fuses, I'll add a bit more information at the end of the video. On the other hand, the Union Army was well supplied with ammunition. According to the editors of Stackpole Books in their book, Gettysburg, the Story of the Battle with Maps, General Meade made sure to investigate his ammunition inventory before the battle, and further, the Union artillery commander, General Hunt, had an extra 60 wagon supply of artillery ammunition waiting nearby, while on the Confederate side, General Pendleton, at an inconvenient moment, moved the Confederate ordnance train, apparently without telling Colonel Alexander. On the map, see Confederate and Union artillery positions on July 3. Union artillery is in black, Confederate artillery is in red. According to Philip Lano's book, Gettysburg Campaign Atlas, the Confederate side had 240 artillery pieces present at Gettysburg. Of the 240, apparently only 160 to 170 guns were available for the bombardment. Confederate artillery was arranged by corps, as you see here. Longstreet's corps on the south, Hill in the center, Ewell's corps on the north and east and apparently Ewell's artillery did not play much of a role. 
Longstreet's artillery was normally commanded by Colonel J.B. Walton, but for the third day's actions, General Longstreet gave Colonel Edward Porter Alexander tactical control. Colonel Alexander's special role was to pick the best moment for the infantry attack to start. And heads up, there's lots of back and forth and controversy in this role. And this is another topic I'll skip over. If you want more information, read the Sears and Coddington books listed at the end of the video. Also, that morning, Colonel Alexander put in reserve nine guns with orders that they should be ready to move forward with the infantry when they attacked. You'll hear more about these nine pieces later on. Using Philip Lano's numbers, the U.S. side had 366 guns present at Gettysburg, but of that less than half, 118 or 119 guns, were used during the bombardment. Union artillery was also arranged by Corps, but on the Union side, General Meade's chief of artillery, General Henry Hunt, exercised much firmer control than General Pendleton on the Confederate side. From the south, a battery of maybe six guns from the 5th Corps up on Little Round Top, commanded by Lieutenant Benjamin Rittenhouse. And then almost directly opposite Pickett's division, 41 guns from General Hunt's artillery reserve, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery. In the center was 2nd Corps artillery, commanded by Captain John Hazard, with 28 guns. On Cemetery Hill, Major Thomas Osborne commanded 11th Corps artillery, and he had 26 guns. The bombardment started around 1 p.m. And here I added lines to the map that show Confederate fire against Union positions. And these maps are based on maps in the book produced by the editors of Stackpole Books. Captain Hazard's five batteries in the center were hit repeatedly. The area around Webb's infantry brigade seemed to be the focus of Southern fire. Rorty's battery had two of their four guns knocked out, and Captain Rorty was fatally wounded. Two Union batteries were withdrawn, Perrin's and Arnold's batteries. Cushing's battery probably should have been withdrawn, but was not. And Stephen Sears wrote that Lieutenant Cushing's battery was the hardest hit, and toward the end, four of his six guns were disabled. And you'll hear more about Cushing's battery in Part 5. When the Confederate guns opened up, General Hunt had the U.S. artillery postpone opening fire by about 15 to 20 minutes, and then fire slowly, not wasting ammunition, and firing only against those batteries most destructive to the Union side. All the U.S. commanders expected an infantry attack, and General Hunt's priority was to defeat that attack, so he wanted to save ammunition for use later on. Hunt preached saving long-range ammunition, which is solid shell and case shot, for use against infantry at the start of the advance, and then using canister to finish off at close range. The Second Corps commanders showed themselves along the front of the lines during the bombardment to support Union morale. General Hancock, the Second Corps commander, and General Hayes, who commanded the division north of the angle, rode back and forth on horseback. General Gibbon, commander of the division on the south side of the angle, walked back and forth in front of the Union line. Major General Hancock saw the Union batteries not responding to the Confederate artillery, and remember this was by Hunt's order. Hancock was a fiery guy and he lost his temper. He ordered the Second Corps artillery here under Captain Hazard to open fire, and Hancock then encountered Lieutenant Colonel McGilvery, probably near here, why in hell do you not fire with these batteries? And McGilvery responded that it was General Hunt's orders to not open up yet, and the time had not come. Stephen Sears described Colonel McGilvery as a tough former Maine sea captain, unquote, and a man that could not be intimidated. Understand that a major general outranks a lieutenant colonel by three ranks. It goes lieutenant colonel, colonel, brigadier general, and then Major General. Hancock is a Major General and a Corps Commander. 
McGilvery is lieutenant colonel, and McGilvery certainly thought he knew better than the general, knew he was following orders from his superior, which is Brigadier General Hunt, and knew that Hunt would back him up. So the Second Corps artillery, under Hancock's control as corps commander, opened fire early, but McGilvery's batteries held their fire and saved their ammunition. We'll hear more about that in Part 5. The Union batteries eventually all opened fire, and this map shows Union fire against Confederate positions. And notice McGilvery's batteries here were not firing. And Stephen Sears wrote about this defiance of the Second Corps commander's orders. McGilvery's stubborn stance importantly saved the ammunition of his 41 guns to confront the rebel charge when it came. But there's more to it even than that. McGilvery's batteries, in their concealed position, had thus far been neither seen nor targeted by the Confederate gunners. Indeed, only one of his batteries would be hit all afternoon. By fighting off Hancock's demands, McGilvery did not reveal his position and so preserved a major weapon of surprise for use against Pickett's charge." Unquote. General Hunt toured the gun line and ended at Cemetery Hill, maybe about here, and met with the 11th Corps Artillery Commander, Major Osborne, as well as the 11th Corps Commander, General Howard, plus General Schertz, who was a division commander in 11th Corps. The Union generals were considering their position. Everyone agreed an infantry attack was coming. They all felt confident of the outcome and felt sooner was better than later, Remember, it's already mid-afternoon on a day with the temperatures in the mid-80s. Hunt and the other Union generals, apparently everyone except General Hancock, agreed it would be a neat idea for the Union artillery to play dead. Lure the Confederate infantry off of Seminary Ridge and out into the open. In Meade's absence, General Hunt took responsibility for the decision. Hunt then rode south along the Union line, ordering the Union guns to slowly cease fire. And once again, General Hancock, the Second Corps commander, overruled General Hunt, the artillery chief, and Second Corps guns continued firing. The result was that when the attack started, the Second Corps guns had used up their long-range ammunition. But overall, the intensity of the fire from Union guns did drop off. And on the Confederate side, Colonel Alexander noticed. Colonel Alexander, commanding Longstreet's guns, saw the Union guns at first not open fire, then return fire for a time, and then go quiet. Let's follow Alexander's effort to understand what this meant and how to respond. Stephen Sears in his book described how the changes in the federal response pulled Colonel Alexander one way and then another. The Confederate bombardment was intended to prepare the way for the infantry charge, and Alexander's first thought was that 15 to 30 minutes would do the job. The Union guns were fairly quiet for the first 15 minutes or so. Remember, General Hunt ordered them to wait 10 to 15 minutes before opening. But when they did open up, Sears quotes Alexander thinking, it'd be madness to send troops against a line that was blazing like a volcano, unquote. But, Alexander had already been firing at full speed for 20 minutes and was afraid that if he continued firing at this rate, he'd run out of ammunition. So put yourself in Colonel Alexander's shoes. You're a young colonel, temporarily in command of the Corps artillery, and General Longstreet has asked you particularly to decide when is the right moment for the infantry attack to be launched. And according to Sears, 25 minutes after the bombardment started, Alexander sent a note to the two division commanders leading the charge, Pettigrew and Pickett. General, if you are to advance at all, you must come at once, or we will not be able to support you as we ought. But the enemy's fire has not slackened materially, and there are still 18 guns firing from the cemetery." Unquote. I don't know how Pettigrew responded to this note, but Earl Hess in his book, Pickett's Charge, wrote that General Pickett said to his staff, Boys, let us give them a trial, unquote. And orders were sent to his three brigades to get ready. 
Pickett rode over to General Longstreet, who was sitting on a fence about here. Pickett showed Alexander's note to Longstreet and asked him, General, shall I advance? And Longstreet gave no verbal response. He might have just nodded his head. And Longstreet wrote later that he was overcome with emotion. Pickett answered, I shall lead my division forward, sir, and rode away. In the meantime, Union fire had dropped off. Earl Hess described the scene from Colonel Alexander's point of view. It appeared as if the fire of the guns around the angle was quickly decreasing. He also noted that the fire along other parts of the Union line seemed to be decreasing as well. This was an unexpected turn of events. Unquote. Alexander wrote a second note to Pickett. For God's sake, come quick. The 18 guns are gone. Come quick, or my ammunition will not let me support you properly. Unquote. After his meeting with Pickett, General Longstreet rode over to the artillery line to check on progress of the bombardment. And Longstreet found Colonel Alexander and asked for a report. It all stopped there. What did Colonel Alexander report to General Longstreet? And what happened next? See Part 5 for the rest of this story. It seems generally agreed the artillery bombardment started around 1.07 p.m. Using Colonel Alexander's timing of the notes, it seems the infantry attack which followed might have started around 2 p.m. If so, that means the bombardment lasted one hour. Hessler and Motts, in their book Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg, researched this question and in their book provide a table comparing Union and Confederate perceptions of how long the barrage lasted. And they feel the consensus opinion is about two hours, which would have the bombardment ending and the attack starting about 3 p.m., which doesn't square with Colonel Alexander's timings. And you'd think Colonel Alexander would know, but this discrepancy is just one example of things we don't really know about the third day at Gettysburg. None of the writers I've seen claim the bombardment was really effective. Philip Leno wrote, The massed guns Lee has assembled to neutralize the Union batteries managed to disable only 14 Federal cannons. And when the Confederate bombardment ends, Meade has fresh cannons with ample shells ready for Lee's infantry. Unquote. Coddington wrote, No great harm came to the men. Unquote. Hessler and Motts quoted General Hunt as pointing out that most of the Confederate shells landed in rear areas and called the bombardment a mere waste of ammunition, unquote. Did the bombardment do more damage to the Confederate side or the Union side? The next time you're at Gettysburg, if you get a chance to talk to one of the guides, ask them. Those guides invariably seem to know more than anyone else. Regarding the problem with fuses in Confederate ammunition, see also a YouTube video featuring Gettysburg guide Gary Cross. The video is titled, The Battle of Gettysburg Tour, Pickett's Charge. At about 12 minutes into the video, Cross says that the overshooting occurred because the rebels were using new fuses from New Orleans. These new fuses were not field tested, were packed tighter and thus burned longer, and exploded a bit later than the old fuses, which were sourced from Virginia. Okay, he says they were using new fuses from New Orleans. Think about this. This is July 1863. New Orleans was captured by the Union in May of 1862, 14 months previous. But then, let's turn to a different social media source, the Civil War Talk Discussion Forum. And we were discussing the Gary Cross video, and one poster responded this way. After Gettysburg, a Lieutenant Dinwiddie, working for the Confederate Ordnance Department, examined fuses from Richmond, Selma, and Charleston. He determined that the ones from Selma and Charleston burned one second longer than the ones from Richmond and the Army of Northern Virginia were using largely Richmond fuses, but were restocked 
with the others after Chancellorsville? So many unanswered questions.